he lied to you. I'm not going to say a few words. I'm going to say way too many. <laughs> <laughs> Those headlines are a bit misleading. <laughs> Physically, this place was a dump. <laughs> <laughs> the building for years stood largely abandoned. Duke was sharing some of the not yet named Bryan facility with our small administrative staff, which in 1979 had begun to move on to its first floor and was slowly beginning to encroach onto the second. Bell, Reynolds, and Watts were off limits, and they should have been. <laughs> Paint was hanging off their walls in festoons. Water was standing everywhere. White, now royal, had been condemned even while the nursing school was still using it. <laughs> it became a boy's residence hall as we hoped to hasten its demise. <laughs> Hill became the girls' residence hall, and its basement housed the history and English faculty, and where the language lab is now, Ross Baker taught biology. Right out of the back, yard, the back door were the woods that covered the back half of this lot. That was her lab. The athletic facility was an outdoor swimming pool just outside the Hill classroom, which made made teaching in those classrooms in the fall and in the spring impossible. <laughs> yeah, uh, late that the Friday night before the uh, students were to arrive on Sunday, the painters finished their work in the dorms. The faculty, the residential staff, and the administration spent a hot Saturday cleaning up those dorms, putting mattress covers on the mattresses. Neil Clark, my colleague in English, and I alternating between the swing blades and the mower, cut the grass around the dorms, which was a foot, a foot up to a foot and a half tall. John Armitage, who lived in Durham and was a member of that first class, frantically put screens in the windows of the unair conditioned dorm rooms. Students arrived on Sunday. Every one having left a better equipped, fine physical plan than they were moving into. Nonetheless, they stayed. They graduated. They went to college. And they have remained remarkable supporters of their alma mater. And the dump began to become pretty snazzy. In the second years, I was helping Ross move some of the of her equipment to the brand new biology lab in Bryan. I remarked that she must be very pleased to be excited. To which she replied, you can teach a lot of biology in the woods. <laughs> it's a notion which reminds us that the grade school is not made up of just the stuff. It's, it's the folk. And it's their willingness to take advantage what they've got. Given the different <clears throat> definitions between vacation and work, there are still some small players coming back to school. Returners catch up with old friends. New folk begin to find colleagues who will unravel the mysteries. And there is a certain comfort of settling into ways experience was made familiar. But on that first day, there were only vaguely familiar faces. There was no one to ask because no one knew any more than the asker. <laughs> there were no comfortable syllabi to organize the future. We had not <clears throat> really even been able to prepare during the summer because we didn't know what to prepare for. There was to be a program, but nobody knew what the program was to be. We had each spent our summers building air castles in the sky. But we were all sure, even in the midst of our dump, that we had been entrusted with something special. By some incredible fluke, we were given charge of this great educational group. It had not been everybody's dream. The NCAE 
the Pope. The Lieutenant Governor had had to cast the tie-breaking tie vote in the legislature to establish the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics. In giving the school dumbfounded freedom to shape its own program, its own destiny as well. Other than the name, the goal of excellence, a budget, and an admissions plan based on congressional districts, those of us who arrived on that first day were free to create the school, the education that we thought best. We were explicitly outside of and free from the expectations of the Department of Public Instruction. We had no connection to the university, and everything seemed possible. When we first gathered, all of us, almost 25 of us, including the faculty, the residential staff, and four administrators in a conference room that was just about where Katie Wagstaff's office is now. <laughs> We were seated around a table that couldn't quite fit all of us, leaving a few to sit in the corners around the room. One of the first questions we addressed was how much student time each day would each of us require to provide excellent education in our area. When we towed it up, <clears throat> <laughs> this was it. This was our chance to get exactly what we wanted, what we needed, and what we had dreamed of. But when we toted that dream up, we discovered that we were requiring about a 38-hour working. <laughs> Oops. Maybe not everything was possible. Out of necessity, we talked on and on, and we're still talking on. Uh, we talked on and on, slowly realizing that my dream had to be part of your dream, had to become a part of our dream. And by the time the students had arrived, all that serious talk, and NASA sending a man to the moon had never talked so high-mindedly uh, or so seriously. All that talk had created a serious, sharply focused academic plan to speed 16-year-olds well on their way to graduate school. It was pretty much to be books and classrooms. Unfortunately, the students themselves arrived. <laughs> <laughs> and within the first week, some of those young people, not party to our serious talk, not aware of our graduate school plan, approached Branson Brown, he Brown Field out back fame. He was our athletic coordinator. And they said to him, why not a cross-country team? He made a few phone calls, bought a few t-shirts, took them to Joe Lyles, the art teacher, who stenciled NCSSM on them, and by the end of the first week, we had the beginnings of a varsity athletic program. <laughs> By the end of the year, we also were in the student government business. We were also in the prom business. <laughs> Adam, in probably misplaced opposition to cheerleaders, lingered for several more years. But inevitably, but inevitability is inevitable, and soon we had a cheerleading squad. Clearly, the graduate school beginning to learn how to coexist with the high school. The experience, <clears throat> these experiences and so many subsequent ones have taught us and continue to teach us that our dreams and ideas need to start big and all the constituencies and all the folk that need to sit at the table believe that all things are possible. In the process, we need to con constantly remind ourselves we are pretty free. We still aren't part of or subject to the Department of Public Instruction. While we are now part of the university, they really haven't entered our world too forcefully. We were not for years even in the accreditation box because we thought the process would be 
too limiting and too shaking of our program. We didn't officially compute grade point averages for two decades. And even without GPAs and accreditations, our students still got into college, good colleges, and won scholarships, big scholarships. Just as we did then, we need now to remind ourselves that dreams have a lot of room here to grow, and they can grow. We, we can almost write our own book. We also have to remind ourselves that choosing a possibility sometimes eliminates other desirable possibilities. Thus, we tried then, just as we continue to try, to make boxes large enough and inclusive enough to fit, and to be ready immediately to renovate them, or to begin again when the lack of a team makes them limiting. Varsity athletics and homesickness also reminded us that it is inevitable and proper for 16-year-olds to remain 16. This, of course, led to a much larger code of conduct than we had had. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Davis, the first chairman of our mathematics department, often said that we don't teach subject material, but we teach young people. If we teach them, the subject matter will follow. A very practical application of this, of this people primacy principle came in his suggestion at our first comment writing session. <clears throat> that we first needed to have something both real and nice to say. Then we needed to define a problem if there was one and suggest a solution if there was one. And then we needed to end with something nice. Twice a year I think of this, and however difficult, try to follow its prescription. The academic business is the people business this teacher sometimes needs to be reminded of. My fellow grass cutter, Neil Park, often memorably reminded us in our early discussions of curriculum, of personnel policies and contracts, of what faculty should be called, of how often tutorials should be held and when, that we needed to be careful of the grand thing, grand name, distinction. We are at our best when we focus on the grand thing and forget the grand man. If we do as the legislature, legislature legislated, if we are excellent, the name will come. And it came early. In the first several years, we were everywhere on the news and in the newspapers. One could hardly walk across campus without bumping into a New York Times reporter, one from L.A., one from Washington, one from Louisville. We were featured on the covers of major news magazines. Nobel Prize winners were on our board. The grand name idea for a war village, our back, was floated briefly for a while. This was an idea where Nobel laureates would come, there'd be cottages built out there, and they would pad around the paths in their slippers and interact with, with juniors and seniors in high school. <laughs> we built a baseball. <laughs> um, representatives from other states came, questioned, and returned home to start schools much like ours, but consciously very different from ours. I was once asked by a new faculty member if this were some kind of special school. Well, we were then, and we are now, a very special school. A mock. And still they come. Last year, a Virginia delegation hoping to turn what they learned here into their own school. The president of the Oklahoma school was here to find new energy and new ways for his school. So we begin this year again. Much has changed. We have new stuff, more stuff, better stuff. But the real NCSSM is not as it was at its beginning. This room is full of people with dreams and notions of excellence that we need to share. And by week's end, we will have young people always the same on the first day. Their entering test scores are just about what they always were when we adjust the recentering of the test. They are
bright, eager, proud, terrified. They are ready to learn. They will be different when they graduate because they are coming to school with different boxes, large and small, in a different time. But they will be equally good just as proud of their time here as was that first class. I know that Ginger Wilson, John Williams, and Cook and Greg, and I are proud of what succeeding generations, of what you have made of this school that we can 